I used to think that being able to serialize a method or a callback would be the peak of custom Unity serialization, but it's actually not too difficult if you're already familiar with Unity's serialization system, expressions, and reflection. In this video, I'll show you how to create a serialized callback system that can store and invoke methods dynamically, complete with a property drawer for selecting methods from any component and setting its parameters. If you're looking to push Unity's serialization capabilities further, this tutorial is for you. Let's get started. All right, let's add a few using statements here. We're going to make use of link today. We're also going to make use of link expressions. Some of you might remember not too long ago, we had a video about expression trees. Very useful if you need to compile a delegate and cache it for future use. And of course, we're going to make use of some reflection. Before we get started, let's collapse up these using statements for some space, and then we can define our class. I'm going to make a generic class called serialized callback and implement the iSerialization callback receiver interface. This has two members, and I'll just let Ryder fill them in for us. We don't need either of them right away. So for now, I'm just going to get rid of the exception throwing, and I'll just put a no op statement in there. Next, let's get a few references that we need. And we can start by getting a reference to the Unity object that has the method that we want to call. We'll be able to drag any component we want into this field from the inspector. Then let's have a string that'll capture the method name that we want. We're not going to fill this out by hand. We'll write an editor tool to do this. And finally, let's store all of the params as type any value. Now, some of you may recall about six months ago, we had a video about making a blackboard. We can use that same struct here to serialize any of the parameters that we need to feed into our method. Let's have two more fields here for caching. After we've compiled the delegate, let's store it here in a field called cache delegate. Let's also have a Boolean flag here to tell us whether or not we need to rebuild that delegate and cache it again. And of course, an easy way to do that is just hook into the on after deserialize method. Every time that method gets run, we'll set the flag to false, and that can signal us that we need to rebuild the delegate. We don't need to go too far into depth into the any value class because it's covered in another video, but just very quickly, you can see here, we've got an enum that defines several basic types and then the any value struct, which allows us to store all of these different types as their actual type, along with several implicit operators and conversion methods that allow us to store and retrieve these values without boxing in many cases. Using a struct like this will allow us to store any variety of parameters we need for delegates without having to build unique systems for every possible combination. Check the video description if you want to see this in more detail. Let's come back to our serialized callback. Here let's have a method so that we can build and cache our delegate. We can start by setting the cache delegate to null. Then it's probably a good idea to have a guard clause here. Let's make sure we have an object and have a method that we want to execute. If not, log a warning, bail out early. On the other hand, if we do have those two things, let's get the type of the target object, and using that, we can find the method by its name and accessibility. Now, it's still possible that we can't find this method, so let's check. If we can't find the method info, once again, let's log a warning and bail out. Now we've got a method, let's extract all the parameter types from that method into an array. We could do a little validation here as well. We could make sure that the number of parameters we've serialized are exactly this length. Once again, if that's not the case, log a warning and bail out. So if everything's looking good, we can use the expression method get delegate type to dynamically create a delegate type that matches the method's signature, including its params and return type. We'll use the parameter types array and append the method's return type to form the complete delegate signature. With the signature, we can use method info.create delegate to make an instance of this delegate and we can cache it in our cache delegate field. Finally, let's set our flag to true so that we don't have to go through this build process more than one time. We're done with the build delegate method now, so I'm just going to collapse it up so we can make some space. And next, we're going to make a little helper method, and that's because I want to dynamically invoke our cache delegate, and that needs an array of objects as its parameters. Right now, we're storing everything as any value. So what I'm going to do is pass those arguments in here. If there are none, let's just return an empty array of objects. Otherwise, let's create a new object array of the correct size. We can iterate over all of the any value arguments. For each one of those, we can use its helper method, convert value, and say we want it to be of type object. We'll just assign that into our array at the correct position. When we're all done, we're going to return that filled object array. We'll be able to use this in the next method we're going to build, which is to invoke this delegate. Once again, let's just collapse this up because we don't need it anymore. 
make a little bit of space. Now we can have an invoke method that will actually invoke the delegate and return our value. I'm actually going to make two versions of invoke. This first one will allow us to pass in any arguments that we want. As a first step here, let's see if we need to build the delegate. That will build it if necessary. But before we continue, let's verify that a delegate actually was built and cached. So if it's not null, we're good to go. As I mentioned before, we're going to use dynamic invoke, which takes in an array of objects. We're going to call our convert parameters helper method that we built. And then we can use the convert classes change type method to convert the result into the expected return type. Now, that's really all there is to it. But in case we actually made it past this point, why don't we give ourselves a little message saying there was a problem and we can just return default. So this invoke method takes in any kind of parameters, but we've actually serialized some here. So why don't we have another invoke method that doesn't take in anything and instead uses the ones that we've stored in our parameters field. We can just call into the other method. Then just before we move on from this class, let's come right back up to the top and make sure that we've marked it as serializable. All done. But in order to use this effectively, we need a property drawer. Let's create a new class and we'll give it an attribute custom property drawer type of generic serialized callback. Then let's start with a method that will generate the custom inspector UI for this given serialized property. We can start with an abstract container, a visual element. This will hold everything we're about to build. And when we're done, we're going to return this root object. The first thing our custom drawer needs is a way to assign the target object. For this, we can access the serialized target object property using find property relative. Then we can create an object field labeled target. We'll make sure it's of type object and we'll bind it to the target object property. So when the user assigns something, Unity will automatically update the serialized data. Then let's add this to the root container so that it's the first thing users see in the inspector. Now we need a way for users to select a method from the assigned object. For this, we can retrieve the method name property and we can create a button. We can either label it with the chosen method's name, or we could just label it as select method. Let's add this to the root, and I'm going to add a note here to add the functionality for the dropdown in a minute. Once the user has selected a method, we need to update the parameters array to match the method's signature. Let's grab the property. We'll make a new container for it and add it to the root. Then I'm going to make a note to come back and wire this up to a separate method where we're going to draw each different parameter type. So for example, vector3 will render differently than a Boolean property. Once everything is set, let's make sure that we apply modified properties to the serialized object. And that's really the core of drawing our UI. We just need to write two helpers. One is going to create the menu so that we can choose a method from the object to use. And depending on the signature, the method will draw fields for each of the properties in the signature. So let's start with the menu first. It has a little bit of a long signature because I need to know about the object and the method and the actual serialized property as well as the button and the root element. But the actual method itself isn't that complex. Let's have a guard clause first, just in case the target object was null. Then let's create a basic Unity menu that we can fill up with all the choices. Next, let's get the runtime type of the target object so that we can use reflection to inspect all of its methods. Then we'll retrieve the field type of the serialized callback that's being edited. And just as a small sanity check, we can make sure that the field actually is a generic type before we continue. Now let's retrieve all the instance methods on the target object, including the private ones. And we can convert the result into an array so that we can iterate over them. Now taking that array, let's create a for each loop. And one by one, we're going to add them into the menu. Parameters going into the add item method. First of all, let's give it a name. Let's mark it as false, which means the menu item is initially unchecked. Then let's define what happens if the user selects this method. We can update the serialized method property with the selected method's name, and we can also update the button text to reflect the new selection. Now here's where the magic happens. Let's retrieve the serialized parameters array from the serialized callback. At the same time, we're going to get the method's parameter information using reflection. Then we can resize the serialized parameters array to match the method's parameter count. Now we know how many parameters this method needs. For each one, let's access the serialized property. We'll retrieve the type field for each parameter, and then we'll update the serialized type to match the actual parameters type. This way, the types of each of the parameters we're going to show in the inspector window are going to be the correct types that match the signature of the method. Now we've changed our serialized object, so let's apply those changes. 
We're going to draw fields for all those in just a moment. But just to finish this part up, we could say if there's no valid methods found, let's add a disabled menu item with some sort of message. We could display no methods found as a disabled option in the menu. Finally, let's display the drop down menu in the context of the clicked button. Almost done. I'm going to collapse up this long method and let's create a new one for drawing those parameter fields. We can just call it update parameters and we can take in the parameters property and its container. We could add a guard clause here and maybe say if it's not an array, let's just bail out. Now let's iterate over each of our methods parameters and for each one, let's retrieve the serialized data for the current param. Let's get the type field so that we can determine the parameters type. Now that we have the type property, we can get its enum value index to figure out exactly which value type this is from the value type enum. Then we can create a new visual element where we're going to draw this type. Since all the different types are going to be drawn a little bit differently, let's just have a switch on the type. So for example, in the case of a value type int, first let's get the serialized integer value. Then we can create a labeled integer field. Let's set the field's initial value to be the serialized value. And then we can update the serialized value whenever the field changes. So we can grab the new value from the event, set it into the int value, and then we can apply modified properties. Finally, let's assign our int field to our new visual element, and we can break out of here. Now, all the other types that we're going to support are almost the same, so I'm just going to paste them in here and not waste time drawing each and every one of them. They're just different types of visual elements with different labels handling different types. Once we've decided and set the field, let's add it to our container. Now we're almost finished. We just have a few things to hook up now that we've created these two helper methods for drawing the menu and drawing the parameter fields. So let's open up our method where we're drawing the dropdown. After we've chosen a method, we need to update which of the parameters are shown in the UI. So here where I have the to-do message, let's find the last child element, which is going to be our parameters container. Let's clear it out and then let's repopulate the container with new parameter controls. So this is great. As soon as we've chosen a new method, it's also going to show us all of the parameters we need for the signature right underneath that choice. Back in our first method, create property GUI, we have two notes to fix up here. Right here on the bottom one, we also need to update our parameters because we're going to get those serialized parameters and we need to draw it initially. For our other note, we want to connect up our button to actually show the dropdown. So we can call our other method and pass in all those parameters that we need. Well, we're actually all done coding, but I guess we might as well set up a little example and make sure that it works. So let's set up a little mono behavior here. First of all, let's have a serialized callback with a return type of int. So then let's make a few methods that match that signature. Maybe we want to multiply an integer by two. We could add two numbers together. We could multiply a vector by a certain factor and return its magnitude as an integer. In our start method, what we could do is invoke that callback as long as it's not null. Then let's just log out its result to the console. Let's go try it out. Let's start by adding the example component to this game object. We could use any component as the target, but for now, let's use this component as its own target. Clicking select method is going to show us every available method from this component. And right up at the top, you can see several of the ones that we just defined. If I select multiply by two, it shows us that the signature for that method requires one integer. So let's put two in there and press play and see what happens. Down in our console right away, we can see the result is four. But let's make sure this is working by choosing a different method. Let's choose one with more parameters, so maybe add two numbers together. Here, let's add two and five together. Press play. Right away, we see the result is seven. So that's very nice, but we're getting a lot of choices in that menu. Let's come back in here to our drawer and limit the number of choices we get. There's different ways to do this, but maybe one option would be that we only want to show the methods that have the same return type. Let's capture that return type here. We can call it generic type. Then when we're getting all the methods, let's filter it such that we only get the ones where the return type matches the generic type of our serialized callback. So now if I click the button, we have a lot less choices. Let's pick uh, multiply magnitude and let's see how a vector looks here. It renders all right. Let's give it some values. Maybe we could say one, two, three. So let's multiply the magnitude of vector one, two, three by two and see what the result is. So it shows as seven in the console. I think we all know that's not correct, but we also know we're using a serialized callback of type int. Let's jump into code and make it a serialized callback of type float. 
I'll just really quickly change all the necessary ones to be floats here. So the serialized callback is going to be type float. And we can also change the multiply magnitude method to return a float now. Now there's only one method on this component that has a return type of float. So you see the menu items have been greatly reduced. Of course, now when I press play, we're going to see the value that I expect in the console, 7.483315. And with that, we're going to wrap up this video. I'll leave a link to this code in the description. Feel free to take it, make it more robust, add more features, whatever you like. Hit the like and subscribe if you want to catch a new video like this every Sunday. And no matter what skill level you're at, join us on Discord. I guarantee you will learn something new there as well. Not to mention, that's the place to stay up with things like discount codes and other channel announcements. As always, I'll put another related video up here on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.